شر نفسي وسيئات عملي وشياطين الجن والإنس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمين الله في أرضه صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا بقية الله في أرضه عجل على ظهوره صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد I seek refuge with God Almighty from every form of evil, especially that of my own soul and of every satanic being, whether that be a human or a jinn, a jinn. I begin in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. All praise belongs to God, Lord of all worlds. And I ask him to shower peace and blessings upon the chosen ones and upon the guardians of their message, especially the final chosen one, the seal of all prophets and messengers, and upon the twelve guardians amongst this progeny. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As-salamu alaykum, peace be upon you all. And the blessings of God Almighty and His mercy. God Almighty says in the Holy Quran, وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَّةٍ فَلَوْ لَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ يَتَفَقَّهُوا فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ This is a verse I mentioned yesterday. One translation reads, Yet yeah, it is not for the faithful to go forth en masse. They shouldn't go all together for this aim. As some uh, tafasir say, either on the defensive struggle of jihad or for seeking knowledge. Not the entire community goes out to the battlefield. Not the entire community goes to become specialists in the Islamic faith, in the religious studies. But why should not there go forth a group from each of their sections to become learned in religion? So if not everybody can go and do it, we need some people that stay back home, that make sure that society functions, that community, the community has those to fulfill its various needs in different areas of specialty. We need the doctors, we need the engineers, we need the people who will be specialists in the various fields of human life whether they be fields that require technical study or academic study, whether they require practical skills or they require academic skills. There are different features and different aspects of life that require different sets of skills. Not everybody is to become a specialist in religious studies. Not everybody is going to be dedicated to defending the front lines of the, of the country or the, the community. There are different functions, and without these different functions performed by society, different members of society, the community would not be able to function. But why should there not go forth a group from each of their sections to become learned in religion, and to warn their people when they return to them, so that they may be aware? Yesterday, I mentioned this verse in the context of one of the one of the lines of argument or one of the references that are given to argue from for the issue of following scholars 
for the issue of having a group that goes and seeks religious knowledge to become well equipped enough in order to deliver the message to the rest of the community. So we need a group of people who become specialists in religion. We need people that seek that knowledge and we need the ones who are going to hear that knowledge to accept it and to follow it, to beware, to be conscious in their choices as a result of what they have come to learn and come to know. I mentioned this in addition to other lines of argument, some that are mentioned in the hadith and others that are more that are closer to home in the sense that they're just using sound-minded reasoning. I'm going to hone in on that last, last line of reasoning today and I'm going to continue from where I left off yesterday after I make this, this summary. At the end of the day, what we're looking for is how do we have a clear conscience before God? How do we have justified choices? How do we have excusable choices in this test of life? When we're brought down into our graves, may God protect all of you and extend your lives in the best of ways. But the reality is, even if we live for a billion years, in the billionth year, we have to face the reality that this is our last year. And we will enter a grave. And in that grave, we will face the questions, as it's been reported, the questions of those angels that have been delegated with that task of questioning us for our choices in this life. What answers do we have when we'll be asked, why did you make that choice? Why did you believe that idea? Why did you follow that leader? All of these different questions, do we have the answer to them? How do we know that we're in the safe zone? To know we're in the safe zone, we start by answering questions about our worldview. Where did we come from? Where are we headed? What is our state in the place that we are in right now? And how do we get to where we're headed safely and securely? These are the questions that we've talked about. And these are the questions that the main religions on earth, the, the key religions that are attributed to the belief in God, belief that God sends prophets and messengers, the belief that there is a day of judgment, a time in which all records are set straight. When the records are set straight and there's a recompensation for the things that happen in this world, because you don't see that always things are accounted for in our day-to-day -day interactions. Some people that have been wronged may go to their graves and never get their rights back. Other people that have done good may never be rewarded even until the end of their life. When are the records going to be set straight where good is recompensed with good? The rewards are given to those who have done well and those who have committed wrong are held accountable. That is one of the reasons why we believe, rationally speaking, there must be a day in which there is a judgment. And all of these records are set straight. The scripture tells us the specifics about that day. And that is the day of judgment. How do we know that we're in the safe zone on that day? We start out by trying to answer these questions of who started this whole universe? Who is giving us that power to continue to exist at every moment? God Almighty, does He leave us without guidance in this process? No, He sends prophets and messengers. Do those prophets and messengers come for their people at their time and then leave the rest of us, the future generations, without guidance? Not at all. The guidance is preserved and is protected by the guardians. Those are 12 guardians, as we mentioned, the evidence shows. The scripture, the Holy Quran, as well as the, the, the dictates of sound reasoning and what you find from the evidence of the hadith, the heritage that has been inherited generation after generation from the words of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the guardians, one after the other, the imams, the immaculate imams, the masumin, Those who, together with the prophets and the messengers, are the ones of as-sirat al-mustaqim. 
Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. The path of those you have blessed. They are the ones who God has blessed. In every choice they make, they are on the path of guidance. In every way they turn, that's where the Sirat al Mustaqim is. And this is one of the indications that gets us to reflect on knowing without a shadow of a doubt that they are immaculate and impeccable in every choice that they make. Not only the general choices that you think that they would be aware and conscious of everything that they, they are doing at that time. Even what you assume might be a possibility for other people that some people may become absent-minded at certain times. These individuals would not become absent-minded because the guarantee that they are those of the straight path means in every way they turn and in every choice they make, they are on the straight path. Now, what do we gather for how to reach the rulings and the teachings of those who are on the straight path? Once you've come to understand this worldview and you believe it with conviction and you're sure of it, and you face your Lord believing, I testify, there is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God, and the 12 guardians are my Imams. I believe in the day of judgment. I believe that things will be accounted for. God is all wise and all just. I believe that these chosen ones did not leave this world except until they imparted the guidance and they appointed their successors that would protect that guidance. The 12 Imams who are the guardians of the message of the seal of all prophets and messengers, Prophet Muhammad The way to guarantee safety and security during this, this day and age in which the Imam is functioning behind the scenes. Because people have not chosen to believe and to act according to their belief, because they have chosen not to take this roadmap that God has provided, we are, we are prevented, we are prevented and we are deprived of the complete blessing which is direct access to the living Imam. He is here, he is, he is amongst us. He lives behind the scenes, he acts through a network of individuals, he makes sure to intervene when necessary according to the, that roadmap that God has given him of when it is necessary and when it, was need, it is needed to intervene. He's ready. Whenever people are ready for his leadership, he's been prepared and, and ready to lead since the day he came into existence. The holy imam of our time. But we have been deprived of direct access to him because not enough individuals have been sincere in their belief or in their practice to sell to, to pave the road and to prepare the grounds for his public appearance. The coming of the Imam is not a coming from absence. The coming of the Imam is a public appearance from a life incognito, according to many lines of argument that you can see from from rationally speaking as well as from the reports of Ahl al-Bayt. And some of the reports indicates that the Imam, he attends the main occasions, like for example in Hajj, and he sees the people. People may see him, but they don't recognize who he is. This is the way that the Imam, at least in one of his modes of functioning, he lives amongst us. It's just that we don't know which individual he is. To gain direct access to the Imam hinges on our preparation and the preparation of our fellow brothers and sisters. This is what should keep us driven every moment of our day. And I ask God to help me become truer to this commitment before I even ask any of you. Because I know for myself I have a lot of work to do. Even our greatest of scholars, they would advise us not to worry too much about what the signs of the reappearance will be. What are the, the points that may be indicators that the time is near? But rather to be prepared at every moment that it could be today, it could be tomorrow. This is indeed what can have an impact on making that date come closer or making it further away. For indeed, the appearance of the Imam, although it is a sure certainty that it will occur, 
our choices have an impact on when it will occur. Our choices have an impact on the signs of his appearance. And this is something that is discussed on the topic of Bada, which is another topic I won't get into right now. But the fact that our free will, our choices have an impact in the system for determining when the time is ripe for the Imam to declare his public appearance. Because it's not something that's just going to happen through miracles. Alaykum as -salam. The appearance of the Imam and his mission and his reign of world justice is not something that is done simply through miracles. God's way, as you find through the message of the prophets and the Holy Quran, you find through the stories of the Imams in history, it is not something that is done purely through miracles. Miracles are used, or in other words, acts that are beyond the norm, are used for specific purposes to establish truth claims. To establish that this person is the person he claims to be. The one who is connected to God. The one who is the guardian of the message. The one who is representing Prophet Muhammad. So we should not be thinking that the time of the Imam's return is the time, or when I say return, I mean his public appearance. It is not a time when we're just going to be looking for miracles left and right. The Imam... His appearance, in part, hinges on the preparation of those who he is coming to guide and lead. There is a group of individuals, there is a threshold of individuals that need to be prepared in order to hasten the appearance of the Imam. These individuals have piercing insight. They believe in Prophet Muhammad, though they have never seen him. Allah oh. Allah they believe in the Imam, even if they have never seen him. They believe that he must exist because they have a proper understanding of what God is and how God is one and how God is just and how God is not like anything of his creatures and how we are in need of him in every moment and every step and everything we do. There are individuals that act according to that faith that they have. And they prepare the grounds by many levels of preparation. Not only do they personally practice what they preach, but they also help others to come to understand things and help to get others inspired to also fall in line with that preparation. What is the first way we have to be at the service of that project of ushering in world justice? that is represented by the mission of Imam Mahdi and the mission of our Master Jesus, peace be upon him. What is that mission? How do we put our foot in the right direction? What is the first step that we take? After having established this worldview and knowing it through our own independent reasoning, you come to understand this with your own mind. Not because the Sheikh said so, not because that Sayyid said so, but because it makes sense to me. I believe that God exists because nothing can happen without a cause if it needs an explanation. God is the only thing that is self-explanatory. I know that God has no limits, He has no deficiencies, so He has all the power, all the knowledge, all the wisdom. He has no reason to commit any injustice. Doing anything that is not befitting of wisdom would not be befitting of his excellence. So he always has a purpose why he does things for us. A purpose for us to achieve. Not for him. He has no need. He has nothing to fulfill for himself. It's for us. He sends us prophets and messengers to show us how to achieve that purpose. And then he guards that message by appointing impeccable guardians. The miracle of the Quran showed us that the seal of all prophets of, and messengers is Muhammad and that his guardians, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, through the Quran, through sound reasoning, and through the words that we've inherited in the Hadith heritage, tell us there are 12 guardians. No more, no less. This, share, this brings you to the path of the Twelver Shiri understanding of Islam.
Now what? What guarantees our safety and security in the next step? Well, there are some things that are givens in this path. You know that there are five daily prayers. You know that there's the fast of the month of Ramadan. You know that there are certain acts which are surely forbidden. You know that drinking alcohol is forbidden. You know that lying is forbidden. You know that back backbiting is forbidden. You know that all, many things that are givens on the path of Ahlul Bayt, all Muslims agree on some of the things, and at least all Shia agree on some of the things. That much you know on your own. This is kind of like common knowledge. But what about the things that there are disagreements on or the details that people disagree on? What is the definition of ghiba? Backbiting. What is the definition so that we know what is forbidden and what is just not good but it's not forbidden? How do you know the details? How do you know the details of when does the month begin so that we know when we should start fasting as an obligation and when we can break our fast? Because if you know it's the Eid, Eid al-Fitr, you're not allowed to fast on that day. So how do we know? Here is where we come into the next level of thinking. Up until this point, and even what I'm about to say, is based on your independent reasoning. You don't need to rely on a scholar for it. Actually, you may not even be allowed to rely on a scholar for it. Because if in your grave, they ask you, why did you rely on that scholar? What's your answer? Why should you follow a scholar to believe in God? How do you know that the scholar actually knows what he's saying? How do you know? To believe in God, you need to have your own independent reasoning. To believe that there have to be prophets, you need your own independent reasoning. To believe that Prophet Muhammad is the seal of all prophets, you need your own independent reasoning. To believe that there are 12 Imams, you need your own independent reasoning. To believe in these issues that are the core of your worldview, you need your own independent reasoning. You need to have knowledge of that. You need to be sure of that at your core. You need to be content. You need to have your own answers before God. But when it comes after that, now that you know that the path of Ahlul Bayt is the correct path, the path of the 12 Imams is the 12, is the correct path, now, whatever is established on that path, you can take as a given. So you know that certain acts of worship are established on that path, you can take it as a given. But the question comes, what about the things that you're not sure about? Things that are details or things that they disagree about in this path. What do you do? Well, Either you go and become a researcher and an expert on your own and develop your own independent reasoning about those details, meaning you become a mujtahid, you become your own expert on these issues. That is one option. And if you can do it, if you can dedicate your life to it and have the proper steps leading up to it, then all the power to you. May God bless you and, and help you succeed in your efforts. But that, practically speaking, is the path of the very few. That is the path of those who dedicate their lives to study in the Hawza. And it's not only those who are in the Hawza. It is those who, within the Hawza, they have spent their lives covering the grounds of their research carefully and properly every step of the way. Why do I emphasize on this point, every step of the way? Because if they fall short in any step of the way, even if they spend 50 years of their lives studying, but they know that in their earlier, li earlier years of their study, they were not completely dedicated and they were not very careful in each step of the way. They realize they may have developed certain convictions later on based on falling short earlier on. Then... It's possible that they cannot be sure of their conclusions later on because maybe they fell short in their earlier steps and they lost track of where they went wrong because they were having, though they were falling short earlier on. I'll give you a very, very practical example and it's an extreme example on this. And this is one of the reasons why it is not simply enough for us to read books on our own here in the West and think that we can become mujtahideen that are qualified to have our own expert opinions on these issues, on the issues of religious knowledge. 
One of the reasons is this. Right now, alhamdulillah, Daesh is being defeated in Syria and Iraq. Today, they said that that, that mosque in which Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi had given his famous speech declaring his, his supposed caliphate, that mosque, unfortunately, was destroyed. Not because, I mean, it's a good thing that this, the symbolic issue of Daesh was defeated. But who destroyed the mosque and why did they destroy a mosque? That's, that's a heinous crime, whoever did it. But the thing is, there's a symbolic defeat of Daesh. The question is, for these people that follow Daesh, the guy who goes and straps himself and becomes a suicide bomber, the guy who's willing to give his life for Daesh, what is this going on in his mind? Are all of these people intellectually impaired? Are all of these individuals physically handicapped? Did they have psychological issues? Did, are all of them people that you would say need to be in hospitals? What happened? Where did they go wrong? Well, whether it's Daesh or any other person who reaches a flawed conclusion, they must have gone wrong most of the time, at least, at least for the vast majority of cases, if we want to be reasonable, if they are people who were at least somewhat normal, then they must have gone wrong somewhere earlier on. They must have fallen short of doing their proper research somewhere earlier on. Then the problem started to accumulate, the mistake accumulated, until they reached a point where they believed sincerely that they have to blow themselves up. Now, I'm not saying all of them are like this. I'm not saying that all of them have the same explanation for how they reached the point where they reached. But the key that I'm trying to emphasize is sometimes we may become sure of some conclusion down the line, but it's because we didn't cover our grounds properly early on. Some people may be convinced there must be no God. Why? Why are you so sure about that? Some people may be like, I am sure there is no sound evidence of God's existence. Where did you get that sh certainty from? For somebody to reach a conclusion like that with such obnoxious kind of, with such an obnoxious result, it must be that they've they've fallen short of covering their grounds properly earlier on. At least, at least I can say a lot of times that is how you can explain it. And then, does that make their crime, whether it's in belief or in action, does that make their crime any less serious? No, not at all. You see, somebody may fall short of something earlier on, but you still say they're responsible for what they do later on. Because earlier on, it must have been that big of a deal for them to have covered their grounds properly. Because look, was it, look what was at stake later on. There may be differences amongst the scholars about how these people are judged. Are they judged for that last action that they do? Or are they judged for that earlier steps earlier on when they fell short of doing what they've done? But there is no doubt about it. What they've done is hideous and it's a crime. The question is, when I reflect on this, when I reflect on how these people should be held accountable, not only for their crimes that are committing right now, but for whatever they fell short of doing properly earlier on. The question is, when I reflect on my own knowledge, when I reflect on my own experience, whenever I'm making a choice that is not a safe choice, you think about it rationally, you're about to kill somebody. Okay. Have you covered your grounds properly every step of the way from the beginning until you reach this point before you realize and you think that you're right about killing somebody? This is, this is a life that you're talking about. This is what God describes as whoever kills an innocent soul. It's as if he has killed the entirety of humanity. How sure are you that you've covered your grounds properly? Now, that's when it comes to whenever you're forced to, to defend yourself, to defend life, to kill the terrorist because he's threatening humanity, because he's threatening innocent lives. But we're talking also about our consequences, our, our eternity. 
in the hereafter right now. In my choices that I'm making, how careful have I been to make sure that I've covered my grounds properly? So that when I make my decisions, when I choose which expert I am following to know what the rulings are, to know what gives me an excuse before God when I'm asked, by those angels in my grave or on the day of judgment. Why did you follow those rulings? Why did you follow that marja's rulings? Do I have the right answer that gives me safety and security on that day? Have I covered my grounds properly? Do I know why I believe in God? Why do I believe in the prophets? Why do I believe in the seal of all prophets? Why do I believe in these 12 imams? Why do I believe that the, these imams and those prophets are impeccable, they're infallible? Why do I believe that the 12th imam wants me to do things in a way that would either be in line with what is on this path that is common knowledge or that is in line with what an expert says is okay on this path or that is a position of precaution that is on the safe side? Do I have a clear understanding of why I'm on all... Why do I have beliefs about these issues? That is the most important thing that we can focus on before we sleep at night. Because if I don't have a clear answer on these issues, then I should stay awake, sincerely seeking guidance through contemplation, through reflection, through sharing my thoughts with others to help to come to a clear conviction about these issues until I am. But inshallah, hopefully all of us here who have been reflecting on these again and again with the different opportunities that we've had, whether it's on our own or in gatherings such as this or in reading on our own, inshallah, we have a sincere conviction about why we believe in the 12 Imams. Why do we do these common acts of worship that we believe in on this path? But what I'm moving on to today is how do we know what to do on the issues that scholars disagree in or in issues that it may not even be possible for me to side with precaution? What do I mean? Either you become an expert yourself. And I, when I say expert, I don't mean just an expert. You may be an expert physician, but you're not an expert in Islamic studies. What I mean in Islamic studies I don't mean the academic study of Islam. I mean the Hausa study of Islam. I mean the study of Islam that you find in the Islamic seminaries that are on the path of the 12th Imam. I don't mean Islamic studies that is the academic study of Islam from a perspective that does not adopt those beliefs. I'm talking about those who are representing the Imam, who are the transmitters of the hadith of the Imam who are upright on the path of the Imam. You may be an expert engineer. You may be an expert nurse. You may be an expert mechanic. You may be an expert in whatever you do in your life. The skill set that you have, each of us has something to offer. As it's been attributed to Imam Ali السلام, he says the value of each person is what he knows or what he does well, what he has skill in. ما يحسنه. But when we're talking about Islam, when we're talking about transmitting the hadith of the imams, the knowledge of the imams, we are not looking for the doctor in the room to ask him, what do you think? Unfortunately, this is something that is a common misconception, perhaps taken for granted in our communities, at least that I've seen in different communities, different cultures. We think that if somebody's a doctor in something, Therefore, now they're an expert in everything. We look to them as an expert in politics. We look to them as an expert in every, every question that comes to mind, perhaps, and maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but you get what I'm saying. We think to the doctor as, oh, he must know the answer, or his insight is more important or valued than somebody else's insight on this issue. That is wrong. There is, the doctor, if you look to see what is what does he study in medical school, or the doctor in other field, look what they study. Their curriculum has a certain set of things that they study. And it's not including religious studies, generally speaking, unless they also became an expert in religious studies, or they also became a Hausawi scholar. The idea I'm trying to get at is, either we become the expert, we become the mujtahid, covering our grounds properly, 
prerequisite after prerequisite, doing all the legwork faithfully and carefully under the close kind of the close care and supervision of those who have preceded us with wisdom and knowledge. The tutor, the, the tutelage, the, the mentorship of our grand scholars, the ones who have inherited this path generation after generation with care. You see, the scholars are not infallible. They're not impeccable. They're not necessarily impeccable or infallible. However, alaykum as -salam, they have inherited a path with, that has such rigor and care and spiritual discipline in their practice and checks and balances with a community of seekers of knowledge around them in the vicinity of holy shrines to such an extent that these become reasons for you to become more confident in their results even if they're not 100% perfect in their results. This is one of the reasons why you look to those scholars, these maraja, as individuals of high stature, even though you know they're not perfect. Even though you know that they may make mistakes sometimes in their conclusions, or you know that they may disagree, so one of them may, must be wrong. However, they have enough qualifications for them to be transmitters of the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. They are adil. Of, an, of a lofty level of adala, at least for some of them. An elevated level of adala, of being upright and just on the path of Ahlul Bayt in their practices and what they do and what they don't do. To such an extent that their reputation precedes them. To such an extent that even amongst believers that are very practicing in the vicinity of the shrines, they have come to be known as individuals of such upright character where nobody even asks anymore is this guy Adil or not it's a given you ask about whether they're mushtahid or not you ask about whether they are the most learned or not but as for the Adala many of them of the top leading maraja it's a given because of their reputation in those communities that has preceded them to the rest of the world spread to the rest of the world so if you can't become or you do not choose to become that mushtahid yourself, to follow your own opinions, to reach a level of knowledge for your own, that you become able to make those independent judgments on your own, then what can we do? What we can do is, we can refer to those scholars as you would refer to an expert in any other facet of your life. You see, sometimes taking a position of precaution is not possible. For example, when comes the day before Eid, the day in which people think maybe tomorrow is Eid, some people may say, okay, well, tomorrow, if, you're, if you don't know if it's Eid or not, then you can go and travel a distance, the Shari distance, break your fast, come back, and celebrate Eid. You, you're not fasting that day. And then you'll make it up with the intention of possibly maybe that day was still the month of Ramadan. I'll make it up later. Right? You think that that's the way to do it, right? Okay. But how do you know that that is actually allowed? How do you know that that's something that's allowed? You would have to see if the experts, they say that that's allowed. Unless it was common knowledge, you'd have to know what the experts say about it. What intention do I have to have when I do this? You need to know because the experts have done the research to figure out is there a difference if you make the intention? Do I have to travel at a certain time when I want to do it? Do, what do I make on the intention of that morning? And I mean, exa for example, that morning when I want to, when it might be a day of month of Ramadan, that morning, if it's a month of Ramadan, I'm supposed to have that intention at the time of Fajr, right? So, what, did I have the intention of the time of Fajr at that time or not? And then, knowing that I was going to travel, did that make any, any difference on my intention? I'm bringing up possibilities to think about that. You think sometimes that precaution is always possible when sometimes it's not that clear. You may have to double check with the experts to see how do I take precaution? How do I do it? What is the position of precaution? Another example. 
Are you aware, for instance, that there was once an opinion, or at least in some details, in some cases in which the Friday prayer, the Friday Salatul Jumu'ah is forbidden? And on the opposite side, you may have some that say it is wajib. So how do you take precaution? How do you take precaution in that? Some things you can't take precaution. Because there are opinions on the issue that are at the opposite ends. One is forbidden, one is ob ob an obligation. So taking precaution, although it's possible in many cases, it is not always possible. Sometimes you need to double check with the scholars to see, the, the expert scholars. When I say scholars, I'm referring to, in this context, the maraja, which is a much higher caliber of scholarship than the way we use the word scholar in English. The way we use scholar in English is a very loose way. And it could refer to scholar in a different field. I'm talking about specifically expert Hausa scholarship. That is ishtihad. That is those qualified to give their own opinions on matters of fiqh, on matters of religious rulings. Now, so what can you do if you can't take precaution? Well, not only is it an issue, because precaution is not only always possible, even when precaution is possible, it may become tedious and difficult for many, if not most people. For instance, if I live in, I live the, the travel distance away from Manhattan, okay? But I have intended to live where I live, which is, for instance, south of Newark, I haven't intended to live in this that town or city that I'm in for a, a, a time that is like more than two years. Then this place is not necessarily, if it's not more than one and a half years for instance, it's not a permanent residence for me. Okay, so when I'm at home, how do I pray? The distance from that area to Manhattan is a shari distance however. So maybe I've become a frequent traveler. Let's say that I'm still trying to figure this out and there are things that are not clear to me in the rulings or there's a difference of opinion amongst the maraja on the issue. How can I take precaution? Well, maybe taking precaution is by simply just praying double. Once I pray with the tamam, the full prayer, and once I pray with the qasr prayer, the shortened prayer. And for the rest of the time that I live in that area, on throughout that distance, whether I'm at home or I'm at the university or on the way, then I'd have to do my prayers all the time, doubling up for those prayers that you usually would shorten if you're a traveler, other than frequent travelers. But don't you see how that can become tedious? Where a person is now doubling, almost doubling up on their prayers. Some people may have a difficulty to commit to their daily prayers as it is. So how can you tell them then now you should take precaution and double up on those, on those prayers? Now, this is just one example. Some may say, no, that's easy. But there are other examples. And when you start to look at this as it gets in a bigger and bigger picture, like when you're talking about your daily purification rituals, when you're talking about your transaction issues, when you're talking about paying your khums, so what should you do? Pay khums to each of these different marajah? How does that work? How do you take precaution? You get, there, there are issues that it becomes tedious, if not impossible, to take precaution. So what do you do then? What we do is we refer to those experts. Referring to those experts, why do we refer to those experts? And this is a question which different people may give different answers for. But I'm going to try to argue for one of those answers. Because the other answers don't make complete sense. Some may say, for us non-experts, the reason why we should refer to the marja is because the marja told us so. Yeah. But hold on a second. Yeah. I'm going to ask him why I should follow him. Why should I have followed him to begin with about that question? Isn't it circular? When you say, I'm going to ask that marja about why I should ask that marja. That is circular. It doesn't make sense. It's like saying, I won't get out of this room until 
this brother who's sitting right here gets out of this room. And he says, I won't get out of this room until you get out of this room. This is depending on this. His opinion, the marja's opinion, about why I should follow him, for me to take it, it means that I already have established that I should ask him in the first place. Why should I ask him in the first place? So that's not the answer. That's a circular argument. It's not because the marja says so. Some may say, well, it's because the Quran says so. But the question is, are, am I qualified to deduce the ruling from the Quran to begin with? These are verses that have been discussed by the scholars, different intricacies. There's different things to take into consideration when I look at a verse in the Quran. Are there any other verses that qualify it? Are there words from Ahlul Bayt that qualify it? Is there a practice of the community that we have inherited generation after generation that clarifies it or qualifies it? These are things that experts deal with when they're deducing rulings. So am I able to deduce the ruling from the Quran directly? No. So that's not the answer. It's not because I'm able to access what the Quran says directly. Then what could the answer be? Some may say, well, it's because the Imam said so according to this report in which the Imam says, for the occurrences or the events that occur, the hawadith that come up, refer regarding those issues, refer to these people who are who? The transmitters of our hadith, the ones who transfer our knowledge. Maybe because the Imam said that, right? However, the problem with this is this is one of the most important reports that is studied by the experts. And they disagree on completely what to understand from it. They may agree on some aspects of it, and they disagree on other aspects of it. But even if they agreed on what it meant completely in every aspect, they have to also consider the other ahadith that have been reported, the other aspects of the heritage of Ahlul Bayt, the verses of the Quran, the practice of the community generation after generation, all of these factors coming together before they can say with confidence that this is the rule. So, as you can see, this is also not a sufficient line of reasoning for why we follow these scholars. Why we follow these marajah. Then why do we follow the marajah? Why are we justified to follow them? The answer is, what I've hinted at since yesterday. There is a practice that sound-minded individuals go about in their daily lives. And that is when they don't know something, they ask those individuals who do know. They ask those individuals who are qualified to answer. The people who are qualified because they have that reputation where it counts, that you know that these individuals are qualified. You've either seen their work and you know you're qualified to judge whether their work is a work of expertise or not. Or you know from others that are qualified to tell the difference and they can tell you these people know. So when you don't know, ask those who do know. If you don't know, ask those who do know. It's the action, it's the practice, it's the habit of sound-minded individuals that when they are not experts or specialists in something, to refer to those who are specialists and experts in that thing. And not just that, it's not only about their knowledge, it's also about their integrity. You're asking people who you know to be in, have integrity, have the qualifications who are going to lead you down the right path and they're not going to take advantage of their position in life for their own ulterior motives. So you need people who have integrity who are qualified or upright. This is the practice of the sound-minded individuals that we have inherited as human beings, not only as followers of Ahlul Bayt, not only as Muslims, not only as monotheists, but as sound-minded people in general that have inherited this type of a sound-minded practice generation after generation because it's something that is rooted in a sound-minded way of thinking. It is the practice that has many lines of reasoning that justifies it rationally and it's the practice of sound-minded individuals. as And it has been given the stamp of approval by generation after generation of prophets and messengers and imams that have not told us don't do so. They never said don't do that. Rather, 
It's something that would happen in front of them. It's something that have that would be done with their approval. And actually, what you find in the reports and in the Quran is confirmation of something that they encouraged us to do. So the real line of reasoning for why you refer to a marja, why I refer to a marja, this justified line of reasoning is. It's what sound-minded thinking dictates. Either it's a rational position, or it's a sound-minded position that human beings usually take when they're acting in a sound and rational way, a reasonable way. And it's something that has been done before and in front of all of these immaculate chosen ones and guardians throughout history. Confirmed by, supported by, what is mentioned in the Quran and what is mentioned in the Hadith. Okay. There's much more to discuss. It seems I'm going to have to continue this tomorrow because of the time. But just to give an outline, what I'll do tomorrow, inshallah, is what I left you hanging on, what I left you hanging with yesterday, inshallah, I'll continue that tomorrow. And I plan to, inshallah, address some of the objections that are raised on the issue of why we follow maraja, why we follow this understanding of taqlid, why we refer to maraja. Uh, also, I, alhamdulillah, I benefited from some of the comments of one of the brothers in our community here that also shared with me some possible objections. I'm going to try to address some of them. And if there are any other issues that you have, you, you have that come to your mind, not only on this topic, on other topics, I had mentioned to Sayyid Al-Islam that uh, if you have any questions, I would uh, recommend that we write them down and then pass them over. I'll be able to take a look at them carefully and consider whether I should address them during my, my next presentation or after it or uh, whatnot. But I think it's better than necessarily only speaking individually, which is also something I'd, I'm at your service if I can help with anything individually. But I think if we write them down, that will give, give a more opportunity for those who don't want to speak to me personally necessarily or who may be shy to speak up uh, in person. And it will give me time also to consider the, the question carefully and look see if I have to review other sources when I want to address the issue at hand. I say this and I ask God to forgive me.